Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Loreen Tuttle with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Warren William bringing you the story Margin for Love. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Margin for Love. The greatest tragedy in the life of Catherine Ryan happened one dull November morning when dark gray clouds were hanging ominously low over the criminal courts building. Timothy Edward Ryan, prisoner before the bar. Step forward, please. Jury of your peers has found you guilty of murder in the first degree. Have you anything to say before this court pronounces sentence upon you? Only what I've said all during this trial, Your Honor. I'm innocent of the charge of murder. I did not kill Tom Miller. Let your protestation of innocence be noted into the record. However, it becomes mandatory upon this court to pass sentence. This court, upon recommendation of the jury, finds you, Timothy Edward Ryan, guilty as charged in the indictment and sentences you to, to death in the electric chair. Oh, that's preposterous. I... oh, no! No, no, no! May God no. have mercy on your soul. Later in the day, Catherine Ryan called on me at my office. Oh, John, I, I know, I know that Tim is innocent. What can we do? Now, now, Catherine, let's not all get excited and tip over the apple cart. But we've so little time, so little Your time. Your lawyer will ask for a new trial. Then there'll be an appeal taken to a higher court. Meantime, you may rest assured that I will do everything I can to see that justice is served. Everything isn't enough, John. My husband is under sentence of death for a murder that he did not commit. Hmm. You know how I know. In every woman's heart, there is a margin for love. She feels instinctively. She knows, believes. Catherine, I'm not a criminal lawyer. Perhaps that's why I can look at this case from a distance and see it better. Remember, Tim is my friend as well as your husband. I don't intend to let him down. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to see him and try to find a clue that may prove his innocence. But whatever happens, rest assured, Catherine, no stone will be left unturned. <laughs> The next morning, I called on the prisoner. It's no use, John. You heard the verdict. They say I'm guilty. I haven't got a Chinaman's chance. Jim, I'm going to do everything in my power to help you, both Catherine and I. But you've got to help me find the answer. You know what happened, John, as well as I do. I had murder in my heart and a gun in my pocket the night I hid behind that tree and waited for him to come out of his house. I intended to just threaten him if he refused to pay me back for the fraudulent oil stock he sold me. Every penny Kathy and I had in the world, he took it away, he stole it from us by false promises and deceit. I was desperate. Well, I, I stood under that tree waiting. Suddenly I saw him come out of the house, turn in my direction, and then... Oh! oh. <laughs> 
when I came to, I saw his body alongside of me. And my gun lay between us. And the neighborhood was in an uproar. <laughs> Yes, Tim, I've heard the story, and it always ends when the police picked you up. But who hit you on the head? Who took your gun and pumped seven shots into the body of Tom Miller? Who dropped your gun and ran away into the darkness of the night? Who? I wish I knew, John. <laughs> so that I could be the first to shake him by the hand. And that's the truth. Well, shaking his hand won't save you, Tim. You say you heard feet running away after the shots were fired. But only dimly. I, I was half unconscious. I... I heard the shots, and then I heard the feet running down the concrete sidewalk. They they sounded like, well, like little trip hammers. And that's all I can remember. Like trip hammers, eh? Well, that's interesting. Yes, that's very interesting. Why? Tim, unknowingly, you've given me the first tangible clue. Seven shots and running feet that sounded like trip hammers. Doesn't that mean anything to you? No, it doesn't mean anything at all. I don't want to arouse the slightest hope that we've stumbled onto something, Tim. But from what you've told me, I think I know the sex of the murderer. The sex? Seven shots. Every shell there was in the automatic. Means that the gun was fired by a highly emotional person. One in whose heart burned the raging fires of hate. Add that to the running trip hammers and you have... You have what, John? The murderer of Tom Miller. A woman. <laughs> Knowing the sex of the murderer proved of little value during the passing months. Winter melted into spring, and spring blossomed into summer. And in spite of all our efforts, not a single further clue was found. Extra, extra! Ryan to die tomorrow night! Ryan to die tomorrow night! Extra, extra, read all about it! Extra! Only 24 hours remained to bring a murderer to bay. A clever, scheming murderer who had evaded every net, every suspicion. Frankly, I was at my wit's end. Catherine was distraught. Nothing I could say or do would console her. We're at the end of the rope, John. It's all over. No, it looks bad, Catherine, I'll admit, but, well, we've got 24 hours. Yes, I know. 24 hours. But each one of them will fly past without helping us. And then we... Oh, John, the electric chair. It's horrible. We won't give up yet. We can't. I'll go back to my office and see if I can find any lost threads that might uh, have escaped me. Call me there if anything happens. But nothing happened. Either that night or the following day. Only three hours of life remained for Timothy Ryan, and then death. The thought was terrifying, and worst of all, I knew that there was nothing more I could do. I had reached the end of the road. I sat in my apartment and waited as the hands of the clock moved relentlessly forward. One hour to go. One hour to midnight. It's 11 o'clock, Tim. Yeah, 11 o'clock. One hour to go. Oh, poor Kathy. To think she'll have to remember this all of her life. The barber will come in now, Tim. You've got to get your hair trimmed. <laughs> so the electrodes won't miss. Is that why, Warden? That's why, Tim. You know, I don't think that I like doing this job. I'm only human. I know, I know. You can't help it. It just seems funny getting it for something I didn't do. But it's all right, Warden. It's all right, you... You can send the barber in. Hello? Mr. O'Connell? Yes? Well, this is Dr. Oh, just a moment, please. There's a storm coming up, and I can hardly hear you. Excuse me while I close the window. Yes.
Is that now, Doctor? This is Dr. Wilbur of the emergency hospital over on East 68th Street. Yes, Doctor? We've just received an emergency case, automobile accident. The patient is dying. She's just made a will and asked me to call you immediately. I'll drive over right away if you like, Doctor. I wish you would, Mr. O'Connell. There isn't much time, and what she has to say may save a man's life. What do you mean, Doctor? Whose life? This woman, her name is Gloria Dever, has just confessed to the murder of Tom Miller. I broke all speed records that night on my trip over to the emergency hospital. Was this Gloria Dever telling the truth? Was it she, Tim, had heard running away from the scene of the crime? I had to know, and quickly. There was less than half an hour left. Less than half an hour before the switch was to be turned on at the state's prison. Dr. Wilbur? Are you Dr. Wilbur? Yes, and you're Mr. O'Connell. Right, Doctor. Will you take me to this woman, this Gloria Dever, please? Excuse me if I seem over-anxious, but there's, uh, there's so little time. It's too late, Mr. O'Connell. Miss Dever died about five minutes ago. Died? But, Doctor, Doctor, think but here, what... here, Mr. O'Connell, here is her last will. Oh. I, Gloria Dever, being of sound mind and body in the presence of death to him. But the, the, the confession, Doctor, the confession, where I is that? I think it begins on page two, Mr. O'Connell. Uh, yes, yes, you see, there it is. I do hereby confess the murder of my ex-husband, Tom Miller. I see, she was his ex-wife. That's right. I hated him. Five years ago, he deserted me, left me penniless, ran away. I swore vengeance. I swore to kill him. I watched him for weeks, and then one night while I was watching his house, waiting to kill him, I saw a man behind a tree. I didn't see his face, but... I saw he was watching, too. I crept up to him. He didn't hear me. I hit him over the head with a stone. I wanted no interference. Vengeance was mine alone. When the man fell, I saw a gun. And I saw, the too, that Tom Miller was coming my way. I took the gun and shot. Shot until every bullet was gone. And then I ran away. Doctor, you don't know what this means. This verifies everything Tim Ryan said in court. This confession will clear Tim Ryan of the charge of murder. Excuse me if I run. I've, I've got work to do. Yes? Catherine, this is John. Listen, there's been a miracle. A miracle? What do you mean? Gloria Dever, the first Mrs. Miller, died tonight in the 68th Street Emergency Hospital. I don't know yet what happened, but um, listen, Catherine. Yes? She confessed to killing her ex-husband. Take a cab over to my apartment. We've got 35 minutes to stop this legal murder. Hurry now and keep your chin up. You see, John? You see? I knew it. That was my margin for love. <laughs> Part two of Margin for Love in just a moment. But first, a brief message from your announcer.
And now back to Margin for Love with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. What time is it, Warden? It's 11.30, Tim. I see you got your hair cut. Yeah, my last one. <laughs> oh, well, I never did like barbers anyway. Tim, I've been seeing a lot of you lately. Only wish the jury had believed your story about that dame running away. Well, you can't blame them, Warden. After all, I... I did have a gun. There were seven shots fired, and they found me right on the spot. Who could believe that I didn't do it? Especially when I was waiting for him. Yes, that's the trouble with these open and shut cases. Sometimes they're too open to suit me. There's not much that can be done about it now, Warden. No, I guess not, Tim. Anything I can get you. No, no thanks, Warden. Father McNamara will be here in a few minutes. You'll, uh, you'll see him, won't you? Oh, of course. I've got a lot to get off my chest. Not much time to do it in. Judge Barnes? Yes. This is John O'Connell. Can you hear me? Well, it's rather bad, but I hear you, John. What is it? Judge Barnes, the murderer of Tom Miller just confessed, made a deathbed statement at the 68th Street Emergency Hospital. Confessed, you mean? Yes, Judge, in black and white. I've been trying to reach the lawyer who handles the defense, but he's out of the city, so I've got to act for him. There's only 30 minutes left. Call the governor. Call the prison. Tell them that I'm issuing a stay of execution. You call them, I'll make out the papers. Tell the governor I'll send them down by special messenger. Why, Catherine, you're soaking wet. Here, get over in front of the fire. I'll tell you what's happened. Oh, John, don't waste a moment until we're sure. I won't. Judge Barnes has issued a stay of execution on Gloria Dever's confession. I've got to call the governor and the prison officials to advise them of what's happened. Don't worry, everything's going to be all right. Oh, I'm so happy, John. So happy. You won't mind if I stand here and cry a little, will you? No, of course not. It's perhaps the only thing left to do. The way I feel, I could almost join you. I'm all right now, John. Go ahead and reach the governor. There's only 20 minutes. What do you mean, Jim? Father Mac help you? I'm as ready now as I ever can be, Warden. Don't care much about these slits in my pants legs, though. Why can't they send a guy off in his Sunday suit? Prison regulations, I guess. Somebody started this barbarity centuries ago. And for all I learn and progress, we haven't changed much for the better, have we? Yes, it doesn't make much difference. When you're gone, you're gone, and your Sunday suit won't do much good where they send you either, will it? Tim, Kathy was here yesterday. I would have let her see you, only you said not to. Thanks. No, I, I want her to remember me as I was, not as I am. Why make a swell girl like her suffer any more than you have to? I guess you're right, Tim. No use breaking her heart all over again. Busy sick. Why, I haven't even reached the operator. Operator, operator, operator. Number, please. Operator, listen to me. This is John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. Put in a long-distance call to the governor's residence for me. A man is scheduled to die in 17 minutes. One moment, please. I'll connect you with long distance. Oh, all right. Long distance. Long distance. This is John O'Connell, attorney at law. I want to place a call, an emergency call, to the governor's residence. A man's life I'm is... sorry, sir, but there'll be a slight delay. All of the circuits are busy. Oh, hang the circuits. I tell you, a man's life is in danger. A man is to die at midnight. I tell you... One moment, please. I'll connect you with my supervisor. Oh, hang the supervisor. I want the governor's mansion. This is the supervisor speaking. Supervisor, listen... In just nine minutes, a man is scheduled to die in the electric chair. I have evidence to save him. I'm sorry, sir. I can't make out what you're saying. Supervisor, supervisor, don't leave the line. I want the governor. The governor. Do you understand me? 
Get me the governor. One moment, please. I'll try and connect you. Charlotte Brighton. Only five minutes to midnight. Only five Step minutes. Now, I'll, I'll have him in a moment. <laughs> Time to go, Tim. Well, I'd like a last cigarette. Got a match, Warden? Sure, I have. Thanks, Warden. Will you please wear these slippers? Rules, you know. Sure, Warden. Why not? Tim, I want to shake your hand. I think you're a fine man. Maybe you did kill Tom Miller. Well, maybe he deserved it. Thanks. Well, here we start on that last mile. Ave Maria, gracia, plena dominus. I'm sorry, sir, the line is busy. Will you please try the call again? Listen, I've got less than four minutes to reach the governor before an innocent man dies in the electric chair. I order you to cut into the conversation and let me talk to the governor. If you don't... One moment, please. I'll get to the governor if I oh, have to... Oh, we should hurry. Only two more minutes, two more minutes. And then... Hello, 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 supervisor. Supervisor, I'm waiting for the governor. There's only two more... One moment, please. I'm trying to complete your call. One moment, one moment. That's all that's been going on for the last half hour. There's less than two minutes to go. For heaven's sake, get that call through to the governor. Operator. Operator. I don't hear any sound on the phone. Operator. Operator. But the phone is dead. Ready, throw the switch. Twelve o'clock, and the phone is dead. We've lost, Kathy. We've lost. Catherine Ryan and I sat there looking out of the window into the thunderous gloom and the rain that poured down from the sky. It was over. Undoubtedly, Tim Ryan had paid the state in full for a crime which he did not commit. As we sat there, peering out into the rain-swept darkness, our thoughts were bitter. Well, John, no use staying any longer. We tried our best. You'll never know how grateful I am for what you've done. Catherine, I don't have to tell you how badly I feel about tonight. With complete vindication within our grasp, only to lose it in a storm. Let me drive you home. Will you please, John? Of course I will. Here, let me help you into your coat. There's not much I can say. You know that. Except I wish you'd go away for a rest, Catherine. You've been through the mill. You deserve more, but... Thank you, John. I'll stay home for a few days until after I... I bury Tim. And then... Well, maybe rest would be... Well, she's finally got through to the governor, I suppose. We ought to declare a national holiday. Excuse me, please. Yes? Mr. O'Connell, this is a supervisor speaking. I'm sorry, but electrical disturbances prevented me from reaching the governor's residence. Yes, yes, I know. It's too bad. Shall I try again in the morning, sir? In the morning? No, never mind. Good night, miss. It seemed like a death watch. Not a word was spoken between us. What was there to be said? To take our minds off the stark horror of the night, I switched on the radio. Damages from the torrential downpour which disrupted light, phone, and travel service throughout the state may run into several million dollars. 
And here's an interesting item that can be blamed solely on the electrical storm. Timothy Ryan, convicted murderer who was sentenced to be electrocuted at midnight tonight, got a real break. Oh, John! Due to the fact that the storm disrupted the electrical circuits, the electric chair failed to operate, with the result that the condemned man was given a 24-hour reprieve by the warden. Oh, John! John, John he's alive! Get off the radio, Catherine. He's alive! Hang on! Where are we going, John? We're going back to the apartment. This time, we're going to reach the governor. Oh, oh. Don't look now, John, but I think we're being followed by a cop. By a cop? <laughs> Let him come. When he hears what we've got to tell him, he'll lead the way. <laughs> Warren William will return in just a moment to tell you the rest of the story of Margin for Love. But first... And here again is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Well, I finally reached the governor. And today, Timothy Edward Ryan is reunited with his wife, a free man, and cleared of every vestige of the crime of murder. The last will and testament of the first Mrs. Miller proved to be authentic in every detail. According to the doctor who heard her bedside confession, she had planned the destruction of her husband for several weeks. And then, by a stroke of fate, found a way to place the blame for the killing on an innocent man's shoulders. The black sin of revenge lurked in both of their hearts, it's true. But the one reached fulfillment, the other smoldered. And rest assured, Timothy Ryan learned a bitter lesson he won't soon forget. Hereafter, he'll leave the revenge to heaven where it belongs. <laughs> Next week, I'm going to tell you a story about love and intrigue in Monte Carlo. A handsome young American composer wanted to meet a very charming and lovely girl, and I arranged it. But I didn't plan on what happened shortly thereafter. A group of international schemers and plotters offered to give me a strange and unusual will for my collection. And I appreciated their intentions until I learned the will was to be my own. <laughs> How my young friend and I managed to escape with our lives and foil their plans is told in the unusual story we call They Met in Monte Carlo. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Robert Webster Light. Any similarity between names used on this show and those of living persons is purely coincidental. This is a Teleways feature produced in Hollywood. Hollywood.